Everybody, welcome to tonight's amazing program. Thanks for joining us at our new 9.30 time, special early, so now we have much more energy. I drank less coffee today, Baruch Hashem, and we're ready to start fresh and early. Um, tonight is going to be the 79th year with the Let's Get Real program with Coach Menachem Berenfeld. We are very happy that everybody's here. First, I always start off thanking everybody every week for coming. And again, the platform is really exploding thanks to all the people that come every week. This is all natural. This is all from people that come and they post on the WhatsApp statuses and they tell people about the program. Again, I appreciate it. Please tell people every week about the program. Not every program is for everybody, but every, it's negated to every person, every program. So it might not be for you. Let's let people know about it. And we got, again, tremendous feedback from the last few programs. It's been really off the charts and we hope to continue that tonight with Adam. No pressure. Um, for anybody who uh, wants to join the, our WhatsApp statuses, I send out every Sunday the flyers. Just please WhatsApp me at 848-525-0066, 848 848- 525-0066 and save my number and I will send you the flyer every Sunday. Please promote it. It's a big mitzvah. It can help a lot of people. For all, that, for all the people who are watching this later, not Zaych with us to be with us tonight, please click on the like button for Coach Menachem and every Sunday you'll get his share. If you subscribe to him every Sunday, every Monday when it comes out, you will get automatically the new share. I want to start off first with thanking all our advertising sponsors, the Lakewood Scoop here in Lakewood for promoting us here in Lakewood. Special thank you to Ravi and Yaniv Chazak for promoting us, and a special thank you to Chayel Kalkin and Shmuel Summer from JCN, and the Jewish Content Network for always promoting us on across all the digital platforms. The Coach Menachem Show is collaborating with the OK Clarity to bring greater health and wellness to the Jewish community around the globe. OK Clarity is the online platform for mental health support in the Jewish community. On OKClarity.com, you'll find the best therapists, coaches, nutritionists, engage in forums, and stay inspired. Links will be found in the email after the show. Menachem will send that out. Again, for all the people joining here tonight for the first time, we start every Sunday night now at 9.30 Eastern time on this Zoom ID. We have many Rabbanim, therapists come on from all angles. Tonight we have Adam Lieberman who's coming from a whole different angle, which we're happy to have him here. Thank you for coming. Next Sunday we have an amazing show, November 14th, with the world-famous Master Chinuch, Rabbi Ephraim Glassman from Taravadas. Anybody knows him, he's, he's the Master Chinuch. We're going to be discussing that anybody who has kids could probably relate to this. We're going to be discussing all the things that I've experienced and everybody's experienced navigating through the chinuch system when it doesn't work for my child. And uh, please, please join. It's going to be an amazing program, deep, and we're going to put everything on the table. So uh, let's get ready. And tonight, again, we have the schluss of having world-famous Adam Lieben with us tonight. We'll get back to him in a moment. Let's open it up with our host, Coach Menachem Berenfeld Shlita Harav Tzadik. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, welcome, everyone, to 9.30, fresh and early. Um, I first want to thank everyone for the emails, feedback. We got a lot of feedback from last week's uh, sheer. Whatever it is, always appreciate it. Always good to hear your thoughts. And for those who gave donations, which is beautiful, helps us to continue. And for those who want to donate, menachemburnfeld.com, there's an option over there. Tonight is a very exciting topic. It's, it's money. And money, everybody uh, wants to know something, either how, what, when, and where. But the truth is money is very tricky. Before we start, the first question is, why do you need money? So that's a, it's a very deep question. What are you going to do with the money? Like the kids always ask, you know, what, what do you ask a, a child? If you win the lottery, what are you going to buy? And you can ask adults the same thing. If you would have money, what would you do with the money? What, what do you need money? So we as... Um, uh, Yidin and Eved Hashem, we need money to, to, to serve Hashem. That's what we need money for. So it's, a, it's important to, to, to know why I need it, why I want it, what am I going to do with it. But the truth is, it says in the passage, it, the money blinds, it, even a small amount, the Gemara says, even a small amount, you, you just don't see the same anymore. Now, if a small amount can change the way you look at things, you can imagine if you have somebody who has a lot of money, things change and it's hard sometimes to stay aligned to, to know where you are once you get the money. Another, another thing is it, it can bring out a person's character for the good and for the bad. If you don't have the power, the money, so you're sitting in a house, you, may, you might try, but the, you can't go too far. But when you have the money, it starts. You can start using it and getting your way through different places and doing certain things. Also, a very important thing to look at. And the last thing of what I was thinking about is 
it really brings out your inner, a lot of inner beliefs to know about a person, to know about himself. Um, whether it's, um, if you don't have, if you're worried, what kind of job you're looking for, asking for a raise, do I, do I deserve it? What am I capable of doing? It really goes down to the core into a person, to the way he looks at himself when, when you're talking about money. And obviously it can bring up a lot of anxiety and stress in, in, in many areas in, in, in our life, Shalom Bias or in Yiddishkeit, wherever we go, money can play a big role. And that's obviously where we have to bring in, before we start today's discussion, a little bit of Imun and Betachen. Because without Imun and Betachen, it, 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 it's hard. But with Imun and Betachen, you, whether you make more, you make less, if you live with Hashem, sometimes it can be a little bit easier. So tonight, Bar Hashem, we have with us Adam Lieberman, who I think he has many, many years of experience of seeing ups and downs from big companies who can help us, whether somebody is just starting off in business or somebody who's been Matzliya for many, many years, with good advice, ideas, and hopefully we should have a lot of Siyat Deshmaya, and for those who need to hear what they need to hear so that we should be able to use it, uh, what we need, and we should be able to be, uh, serve Hashem with our money. Shkoyach. Amen. Beautiful opening. Again, let's start. Let's get into the tonight's shear. Here we go. Again, just so that I say it every week, Menachem's working on the first part of the book, shear one through 40. Adam, you're 79, so you got a while. You're, part, you're in volume two, the end of volume two. Anybody who wants to be involved or donate a shear or be help write it or anything, please email coachmenachem at gmail.com. And it should be amazing. Tonight's shear, we're going to do in schos for Menashe Chanoch ben Rezel Shlamas for success in every endeavor. Baruchnius and Begashmius, Meshashem. Should open up new doors for the person and Rafu Shalema and health for Shane Sar, Bas Miriam Rivka. Again, the share for the hundreds of people that are going to be here tonight and the thousands of people that will watch it. It should be as close to Shalema for that person. Um, anybody who knows Adam Lieberman, say, please get Adam on the share. I heard this already the past who knows how many weeks or months. So, Baruch Hashem, we got him. We had, to, we, had to, we had to use his brother. I guess it's David Lieberman's brother. We had to twist his arm to get him here, but we got him here. And anybody who doesn't know him, I'm going to read his bio and then he could introduce himself. Adam Liebim is a nationally known speaker, sales trainer, and business consultant. With over 20 years of experience, he's personally trained thousands of salespeople and business leaders throughout a wide spectrum of industries. And yes, it's Dr. David Liebman's brother. Adam, please open it up. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Much appreciated. Um, as Coach Menachem said, really nothing in the world can happen without a moon and Batakin. That really is everything. Um, and everything I'm going to share with you tonight, uh, that really is, is the foundation. Uh, just by way of background, uh, I've spent many years, it's an old bio, it's probably close to 30 years now, that I work with people really uh, all over the country, uh, small companies, large companies, um, people starting a career, CEOs that want to start their own company. And what's unique about my perspective, my background, is that it's not only the advice that I give, but when I speak to people six months later, a year later, a company is a year later or two years later or five years later, you see the cycle. And after many years of doing this, I'm able to kind of look back at it now. And when people ask questions and they seek out advice, um, fortunately, I'm able to give a perspective from so many years of experience, kind of like an eagle's uh, you know, eye view of what happens. And the wider scope gives people the clarity that they really uh, hope they can can really have a major impact on their life. So I'm open to any questions that can help people, whether by starting a career, getting a job, um, starting their own business, things like that. What about for people that have tons of money? Are we gonna deal with that tonight also? People that what? Uh, people that are already successful. Can we, can we help them tonight? 100%, it's, it's, a, it's a big topic actually. I mean, you, okay. you say it uh, jokingly, but it's very seriously. It, it's serious, you know, people that um, do have a lot of success, you know, it is, it is, things do go in a cycle many times. And I've seen it time and time again, whether the industry is cyclical where things are up and they go back down um, or things are down, they go back up, right? The industry itself and people themselves, you know, they could be proverbial rock bottom and then, you know, they can hit it big. And like Coach Menachem said, it, it is a major test. What happens? How do these people navigate that? And it, it is very sad many times, you know, people do have success financially. Um, it is, you know, a, a spotlight on how they behave and who they are and what brings, what meters come out at that point. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it, it is an important point to remember because unfortunately, um, sometimes it doesn't bring out the best in people. And there's a few reasons why. And I think it's important to touch on it because people hopefully will have a lot of success financially. And you have to really remember, I mean, sometimes people act in a certain way and do certain things when they get financial, financial success. And, you know, it's not my place at all to say what you should or shouldn't spend money on. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, the shame mitzvah to, to fly privately. Other times you shouldn't be doing it. So it's not a matter of where to spend your money. It's not, you know, certainly my place to say what's an expense that's, uh, you know, rooted in common sense or not. However, however, what I do think I'm, you know, um, a position to share a point on is how a person acts and how they behave. And sometimes people could be a certain way and just an air look easy going, you know, lady or, or, or man, and then they get financial success and something just happens. And I've seen it so many times. I mean, it's, it's like clockwork, unfortunately. And Adam, let's, behave- let's, I'm sorry, let's, let's jump into the polls and we'll go to the questions again for anybody. I'm getting a lot of texts. Let me, let me just, tonight we're going to cover all spectrums, people that are beginning in the Parnassal world, People that are in the pronounced world and struggling and trying to reestablish themselves in many different angles. We got questions like that. And then we got the questions, the people that already are successful, different things to deal with. So Adam wants to get into the questions. He wants everybody to ask. He wants you to be interactive. We're all here together. We're we're Hevra Sichas Haverim, and we're gonna do it together. So let's ask a poll and then we're gonna jump to the questions, Adam. Okay, you ready? Beautiful. Is there any question that's off the topic, or we can ask anything? Anything, please. Okay, here we go. Let's start with the poll, take a break, and we'll go. Here we go. Two questions, everybody, please answer it from your heart. Honestly, let's know. How do you view your Parnassar situation? A, I am struggling to cover my basic expenses. B, I have a stable income and feel secure. Or C, I'm doing very well and able to put away savings each month. So please answer about yourself, person, where you're holding. I'm sure you fit into one of those categories. Um, Let's go for the second question, which is a very, very important question. When struggling with money, how do you deal with it? A, it makes me fall apart and depressed. B, it bothers me, and it, but I just don't think about it because there's nothing to do about it. Or C, I'm totally okay with it. I know in my heart it's all from Hashem. So I'm totally, totally good with it. Answer those two questions. Let's get a feel where everybody's holding, Adam. Great. Right. What's going on over here? You see what's going on? It's unbelievable, right? Let's go five seconds. Adam, sing a song so people, you know, so it shouldn't be quiet. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Again, anybody who wants to ask a live question, please text Usher Parnas. The live questions go first. Anybody who doesn't was embarrassed to ask, then just ask it for your friend. It's not a problem. It's all good. Here we go. Let's share the results with everybody. How do you view your pronounced situation? 32% of people feel I'm struggling to cover basic expenses. 48% of people I have a stable income and feel secure. And you have 20% of people over here that are able to save money each month. So Adam, you see, you see what's going on? You see what type of people you have here tonight? Yes. You see your crowd. Great. Second question. When struggling with money, how do you deal with it? 27% of the people says it makes me fall apart and depressed. 35%, it bothers me. I just don't think about it. And you have 38% of the people that are totally okay with it. And it's all for my shem. So you have a very, I would say, split in three. You know, um, the top, the top, I'm saying more and more on the lower side of the income, like most people aren't able to save, it looks like, like 80%, but the 20% here are, and uh, the bottom, it's all like that. So, okay, I'm stopping to share, you could exit, and we're going to jump with a few basic questions. Again, we should do what first? Or... Okay, so here's some of the questions we'll start with, and again, anybody wants to ask, please text, let's get into it. Adam, I just got married, I need to go into the workplace. I'm having a very hard time deciding where to start and what field that suit me. Can you please give me some practical practical ideas or tips just where to start? Basic beginning. Sure. You know, I, I get this a lot. There's many people that are starting a career. They're coming out of, you know, yeshiva or, you know, they're first entering the workplace and they need to start a career. And it, it's inevitable what happens time and time again. People want to know, you know, the best, the quickest, the, the, you know, in terms of starting a career, starting a business, what kind of job to get. And I, I say as follows. The first thing is a lot of people want to start their own business or they want to go into something for themselves or they want to feel like the, even if they're working for somebody else, they have the, the unlimited upside in that, in that profession or that company or that industry. And it's a very important point about the share. And for some reason, people lose it. They hear it and it makes sense intellectually. Um, then emotion kicks in and the clarity gets going 30 seconds later. And that is this, is that 
you know, there are many people that make money on, on selling on Amazon. Many people lose money on Amazon. Many people make money in real estate. People can't make money in real estate. Many people sell, you know, different services or products. So they sell, you know, they're, they're involved in different industries. They're involved in mortgages and they're successful. And people aren't successful. The point is, is that there's no secret out there with the, you know, the best job out there with everyone's guaranteed for success. Life doesn't work that way. So the most important thing and is sourced out many, many different sources. And it's such a powerful point to really own in your heart, which is as follows. The Almighty blessed everybody with certain talents and certain drives and certain skills and certain desires and certain things that come easily and naturally to us. Um, since we were a kid, we like doing it. You know, we always wonder why people don't have the same skills that we have and why it comes so easy to us. And we almost look in bewilderment while people don't get what we get so many times in whatever area the Almighty blesses in a certain skill set. So the first thing about getting a job is focus on things you actually like doing, that you enjoy doing. Don't go after the money. What happens inevitably, it just doesn't work. You can make money and lose money doing anything. So point number one is find something that resonates with your personality, what you enjoy doing, what you actually you know, may have, 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 have a strong desire to do, things like that. That's point one. Point two is find and find within that world, there's two paths to go, work for yourself or work for somebody else. And, you know, it's very important as your first job, you want to almost test drive the job. And pe before people, you know, buy a car, they test drive it, right? Before people get married, hopefully they date. Um, so people always try anything out that will have a strong impact on their life. Any high level buying decision or any permanent life decision, you want to make sure that you're in the right derrick and you're doing the right thing. And therefore, you want to test drive anything. So it's important before you make a decision, there are many ways it'll, take too long to explain right now, but there are many ways to actually test drive a career to find out if it suits you, if you like it, if it's a way to go ahead and we'll, we'll, we'll connect with you. And that's really the second point. So the first thing is find something that actually will enjoy doing that resonates with your personality. And the second thing is before you jump into it, make sure you have a chance to go ahead and try it out in some way, try the flavor before you commit to a long term. Okay, hey, amazing. Okay, are we doing a live one? Okay, yeah. Hi, Adam. Let's do, let's do a live question. You're on. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your introduction. Um, so, for somebody that is not used to having success, but they would like to get success, how can they get themselves to a place of continued success without being afraid to invest or having any kind of success? Because they're just used to having the basic poverty line. I guess, just pinching to meet their needs. Got it. Okay. So that's my question. Okay, great. I, I, it's, a, it's, it's a follow. I think the question was, how do you actually go ahead and increase your income and make more money if you're used to a lifestyle that you're counting, you know, each dollar? And as the expression goes, you know, expenses will contract or expand depending on how big your paycheck is. People get a raise, somehow expenses seem to catch up to the paycheck. And that's kind of how things work, right? We have, we have an unlimited amount of things to spend money on. We get more money coming in. Expenses all of a sudden seem to creep up the moment we have more money coming in. But I think the real question is- and also, that, and also like how to, not to be afraid to invest it, like in real funds, real stock, like not to be, because you're so used to, you know, like you have said. Have a stable income that put away every year and they put away finally $50,000, they have $30,000, they could buy a piece of real estate. They're, they're, it's not, not their comfort zone, they're not playing it. So how do they get into that zone? It's like, okay, I want to take this risk. It makes sense to me, it's calculated when you're so used to putting away $1,000 a month. Right. So I, and I'm not, I'm not equipped to give an answer, you know, basically without knowing someone's it's, it'll be, you know, irresponsible to tell someone where or what they should be investing in and what percentage they should invest in. People have a different cash bonus, how much they should invest. You have X amount of money. People say you put, you know, 10% here, 20% here, 30% there. The main thing I will tell you is as follows, which I, which I feel is suitable for everybody. Um, you know, you don't want to be in a position that if you're going to take a risk and take a chance and invest in something more outside your comfort zone, you know, if it doesn't work out, it can't affect your lifestyle. 
So that, you know, people tend to take speculative risk and sometimes speculative for one person is, is very safe for somebody else and vice versa. Meaning somebody right now is very speculative being in the stock market, somebody else very speculative, you know, taking a flyer on options or on Bitcoin. So ultimately it's about person's level of financial wherewithal and their comfort level. But anything outside the ability, if you, if you have your basic needs covered and your expenses covered, my opinion is you should not go ahead and try to go ahead and cover your expenses by taking a gamble in the stock market because that can make things 10 times worse, right? What I would recommend is as follows, and I speak to people on a regular basis about this next point. Everybody has the ability to bring in more money doing something they enjoy doing. We all have hobbies, we all have desires, we all have drives, things that we enjoy doing. I find this so true. When people are stressed about money and they have a situation where they want more money coming in, instead of taking a flyer on a stock or your, your friend tells you about a great thing to invest money in that could go either way, you know, invest in yourself. And that means really try something yourself. You know, the best investment is yourself. If you have an idea to do anything, people make money writing, they make money sewing, they make money, you know, it's starting a small online business. They make money doing so many different ideas. So that is my opinion, the best way, because that's something that although you're investing money, it will never give you the stress level outside of your control. When people invest in things they, so to speak, can't control, like real estate or investments or Bitcoin or these kind of things, it's, you feel so really out of control. You feel like you're 100 miles an hour. It's up to some entity you can't even think about or touch or, but if it's up to yourself and you feel like you have some, some say in what happens, your stress level goes to zero and you have a much better chance for a slug at that one. I think that, that brings, us, brings us to the next question about beliefs. It says the chinuch I got was that money is not a good thing. We need to have the tachin and the muna to, to take care of uh, Hashem takes care of our finances. I have a hard time living that way, and I work to make a living, but I feel that the belief I have is getting in my way of being successful. So, what could a person do with the belief? Again, if somebody is uh, not used to making more, doesn't believe he should be making. What could a person do with that? It's two things. Many times people are told that money, you know, is root of all evil and money is not going to bring happiness. I mean, there's an old joke. People say money doesn't bring you happiness. Never had any. Right. They, 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 they feel like it's easy to go ahead and spread that 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 because it gives people a head to not to work or try to really push themselves because they feel it's not going to bring them any more success or happiness or, you know, do more things. So they feel like, okay, let me, why even try? I'm not going to be happy if I get there anyway. I, I don't believe that at all. Again, I'm not a Rav. I don't want to pass on, on someone's, you know, mindset where they should, they shouldn't. But I will say as follows that money, you know, can do wonderful, great things like everything else. It is a tool for greatness, a tool for, you know, helping so many people, helping your life, and you said very well, you know, when we, when we opened up, how to serve Hashem in the best possible way. Um, so I, I, I don't agree at all that I can't do great things for so many people, especially for yourself. Um, but again, people will often, unfortunately, use it as a crux to go ahead and say, I'm not going to come out of my comfort zone. What's the point? It's not going to change. I'm not going to feel better. You know, it's, it's not going to bring me any more success or happiness. And that's, you know, what people use. But I think ultimately it can be a great tool. It is a great tool to do great things. Like everything else, it's a tool and can have a dangerous part of it, of it as well. Maybe we'll touch that later on, but that's really the point. Okay, let's go to a live question. You're on. I thank you for taking my question. Um, you know, in regarding to like taking loans and, you know, sometimes we hear stories of people going into debt, you know, and having uh, issues. You know, what, sometimes we hear people answer, you know, I'll take a loan, I, I won't have to worry, I'll have to be tough and everything will be good. When is that like a proper approach? You know, I don't have to worry about the whole money stacking up and I'll have to pay back. And uh, when is it not? Like, you know, you, on the other hand, you hear stories of people have, uh, they have to pay $100,000 for a chasana and they have this story and that story and the money all of a sudden came. So when can one, like, you know, in an honest form, format, say to themselves, you know, I'll have bitachain and I shouldn't have to worry. And when's just guys just playing with themselves? Great question. I mean, I, I'm a, a, a big uh, masmin and believer in Talmud of the bitachain hotline. And Robert Glenbeck, you know, if you're not familiar with it, covers this point, you know, in detail. But in short, I mean, ultimately, you know, you, you can fool yourself, right? You have to believe your higher level of talk and you can do certain things. But let me just say this, you know, when people say they're going to take out a loan and invest money. Um, there, there are two ways to look at that. 
You know, no one ever, no one, if someone says, I'm going to take out a loan for X amount of money and open up a store or open up a business or buy this inventory and try to sell it online. The reason why that is loaded with anxiety and with stress and concern and should I and shouldn't I and back and forth such bonus because it is a risky thing to do. Right. No one would think of going to college necessarily or learning a skill or going to a course and getting a degree in something. Someone, somebody wants to become a doctor. Right. The level of stress becoming a doctor, although you're going to be at the end of, uh, uh, of schooling, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars in debt. Nobody looks at that and saying, my gosh, it's irresponsible. I'm four hundred thousand dollars in debt. What was I thinking? Rarely does that happen because they know that it's as much as taking on debt. They aren't investing in themselves and investing in a future, invest, investing in something that building themselves up for a larger payoff. So why is a three, four hundred thousand dollar debt is someone going to school much less anxious than someone that maybe borrowed twenty five thousand dollars from their friend to open up a business? And the reason is you feel much more secure and comfortable if you're going to get a degree and you have you know, an investment in yourself that will pay you off worth something else that's much more of, of a gamble. So people that want to borrow money, I tell them all the time. Borrowing money is not a bad thing, but you have to look at someone and say, I have a track record. I tried it on $1,000. I tried it on $5,000. I tried something on $10,000. Now, if I have $50,000, I think I'm going to exponentially increase my success. And therefore, it makes a lot of sense. But for someone that actually just dreams up an idea, does a quick plan and needs X amount of money, you know, those are the people that have a lot of anxiety because they don't really believe themselves that it's really thought out well enough. So specifically, Habit talking is wonderful. You have to have a plan as well. And the plan should be, do you believe as much in yourself and the idea that if somebody else asked you for the money, would you say yes? In other words, would you say yes to yourself? If the answer is yes, then you may have a good idea. Most people unfortunately say, well, I wouldn't give it to myself. And we have to work on those reasons why. And normally it's because the idea wasn't tested. We don't have a level of comfort. You will have success doing it. Adam, brilliant. Love it. Excellent. Okay. You're on. Let's go. Hi, sir. Hi. There's like, it's, you know, I heard the saying, you know, follow your dream, but die broke. You know, like, what is, what happens if you, what you like just isn't really that lucrative? It might be, a, tends to be usually a creative or cerebral profession. They have the demands of the firm lifestyle, which uh, I think people are discovering are, you know, quite expensive. So, it, I mean, I, I think it's very hard to, it's not to say make a lot of money, but to even earn a decent living in that situation. Uh, how do you counsel people in that, you know, who have that conflict? You know, you'd, you know, you'd like to, you know, you all want to make money, but what we make may not be enough, especially for, our, you know, this subculture. Great question. So, so people all the time have many skills. And I go back to before when people are looking for a job or people that are a job they don't enjoy or in a career they don't enjoy. And I ask them, what are they like doing? And their face lights up and whether it be playing an instrument or creative writing or you know, opening up a store or servicing customers. And they go on and on, things they actually like doing. My next sentence I say as follows. It is utterly irresponsible to quit your job and follow your dream. It makes zero sense ever, however, what you should do is have a dial switch. So if someone's in a job they don't like and you have a family to support and they're counting on, everyone's counting you to bring, you know, to, 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 to continue with your job and bring, and bring home a pranasa, that's great. What's going to make your job actually much more pleasurable and what you actually enjoy going to work, if you have an outlet outside your job that uses what I coined a phrase, it's called gift from birth. It's because I'll talk about this in many different ways. We all have certain desires and drives. I touched on this when we first started speaking. And therefore, it is very hard to go through life never utilizing the reason you were created. Just like, a, 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 you know, a dog needs to bark. You know, if a dog meowed all day, it would be incredibly constricted, right? It's silly, but it's, we do that ourselves. We are in jobs and careers and lifestyles that literally don't connect with us. People that are very outgoing people, I deal with them all the time. People that are very outgoing and they love to be front and center. If they are on a, you know, a desk job where they don't interact with people, they're miserable, you know, because they're just not utilizing their ability to express themselves and there's many many examples so specifically the answer to your question is when somebody is in a job they don't enjoy and they want to move on that's great but make sure you have the ability to support your family or support yourself going to a new job and, and the best way to do that is to bring it on as a dial switch you try something at night at an evening try something on weekends and you slowly build it up when it makes practical sense and responsible to go ahead and, and do that full time 
Thank you. Thank you, David. Great, uh, David. Adam, excellent. Uh -huh. It's his brother. Okay, let's it's let's not, let's it's get a compliment. It's a compliment. <laughs> that's right. No, because David just came in. That's why. Okay, what is the right perspective to have while searching for a job? I've been sending out my impressive resume and yet faced one rejection after another. In today's digital world, world, how do you get to employees to how do you get employees to pay attention and give you a chance in that environment? So basically, the person who's sending out his resume is impressive, but he never like seems to like able to land a job or an interview. Right. Because many people do this thing and they feel like they're putting their shtalas in by mailing out their resumes to a thousand people. I mean, ultimately, you know, it, 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 all, it all say the same thing. It doesn't really connect with people. And I give you three specific quick tips how to get a great job. Number one is people say they have no experience. That's completely not the case, right? When someone else had a resume, even though within Yeshiva the entire time, they never had a work experience, you have a ton of experience. Where, how, when, you have experience in being responsible, experience showing up on time, experience being trustworthy, experience following through, experience getting the job done, experience thinking outside the box, experience not letting people down, experience you know, being a, a team player. Those are great things you can teach, you can learn a book, either you have them or you don't, meaning people are either gonna resonate with that as, as someone that they want on the team, or it's not gonna be a good fit. If you have these qualities, it's always gonna be a good fit. So don't sell yourself short and feel like you don't have what to offer. It's a big mistake. So when people, I try to coach them when they get a job, when people say, what experience do you have? You come, like, like I just said, I've experienced in all these areas that are very important to your company. That's the point number one. Point number two is you want to find something. The worst thing to do getting a job, the single worst thing to do is to say you'll take anything, any place, anytime, any job. What, it's, what it just is, is a neon sign saying you're just not qualified in anything. It's not the easygoing guy that takes any job. What it says to an employer is you're not skilled at anything, so of course you do anything. So you want to find out more specifically what you're looking for. When you're asking people for a job, instead of saying, I'll take anything, any place, anywhere, people can't think and people can't, you know, people, you go up to your friend of yours and you say, you're looking for a job. They'll say, what kind of job you're looking for? Here's the irony. The more wider net you create, the less chance of someone thinking about it. It's like me saying to you right now, name 10 people that you know. Your mind scattered. If I say name 10 people on your block, you can rattle them off very quickly. The mind cannot work in generality. So the worst thing to do looking at your job is say, I'll take anything, any place, whatever you have in mind, give me any leads. Can't think that way. So number one, don't sell yourself short. You do have a lot to offer. Number two is be very specific what you're looking for. Know yourself. And the third way is to find that out. And here's how you find it out. You go online and you can look at a thousand jobs out there in every industry. All these job boards, Indeed.com, Monster.com, there's hundreds of job boards out there. But you go to the larger ones and you go through it and you'll find right away job descriptions that are a paragraph long that you would say this resonates with you or doesn't resonate, doesn't, res doesn't resonate with you. Meaning you can go through sales jobs, office jobs, marketing jobs, anything that you think you have an interest in, you go through it. And after doing this for an hour and people you know, take the time, the results are amazing. They'll find, by the way, I want to be as follows. And I'll give you a quick example. When people say they want a sales job, my background is training salespeople, placing salespeople. All salespeople are not created equal. So even if you're not a salesperson, please hear this point very carefully. In the sales universe, there are many different buckets of salespeople, meaning there's salespeople that work on the road, salespeople that work in an office, salespeople that work on the phone, salespeople deal with customers, meaning consumers, salespeople deal with business owners, salespeople that sell a product or service. It goes on and on. So if you don't know what sales job you want to go into, the most important thing to do is to do research on all the industries and find out what resonates with your personality. Because people that are specific have a much better chance of getting a job. Okay, I want to get into one thing before that. She, she's ready to go live, but I just want to jump into one thing because I think it's important to just tell people. I, I just want to tell you what, what, what's going on in today's industry because I see a lot changing. I'm, I'm a little bit in the, work, you know, the, the corporate work world. And I just feel like the last since Corona, tell me to Adam if I'm off or what I'm missing, I feel there's a tremendous need for really diligent, good workers. I feel like people are willing to pay a lot more now. I feel like job, I see the amount people are offering CFO positions, 300,000K, more. Like the amounts people are willing to pay for diligent, good, reliable workers is so high. It's like through the roof. Tell me, tell me just general, let's generalize what you see currently in the corporate workplace, just in general workplaces for you know, all types of workers. What's, what's, what's going on out there? 
there has, in my opinion, I don't know, going back 200 years, 100 years, certainly in the last 30 years, there's never been a better time to be looking for a career or a job. This is clearly a job seekers market. It is a career seekers market. There's more, not only is what you said, where people are looking at talent, there are more companies opening up right now. They're all fighting for the same labor pool. So in the past, when there were fewer companies and someone was talented, there were more talented people and a handful of companies. Now there are less talented people that actually want to go get a job. And there's many more companies that are looking for them. So if you ever want to start a career, there's never been a better time right now to find your niche. And, and, and there's many companies out there that are looking for talent, many companies. Okay. Let's go to the live question. I think it's important to know because people are like, you know what I mean? Okay, you're on. Let's go. Oh, hi. Thank you so much. Um, it, it's really amazing that talking about finding a job right now, it, it goes right into my life situation. I'm an older divorced woman, um, closer to retirement age, laid off, was working in COVID, and um, I have a ton of experience. I have a master's degree. I am very, very positive, and yet... Um, I don't wish to argue with the speaker at all, but it's my experience. I've sent out 100 resumes. I'm getting 10% invitations for interviews. I had the same thing happen two years ago. I was unemployed for two years straight. I've depleted my savings because of this. I can't afford to retire. It wouldn't even pay my rent. And it's a very um, daunting situation because I fear that I'm going to have to ask my children to support me. And so, so I, I, want, I, I don't know what part of arguing what, what I said before. I, I think everything you said, I would agree with in terms of mailing. I don't believe to send out resumes. I, I think it's, it's it, and sadly, it's a, a, a colossal waste of time. It gives people the misguided belief they're putting a shtablis in and they're not going to get much result. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's the best way to mass mail resumes. 10% response is actually pretty high. But I will give you, if, if you don't mind, just a, a, a piece of advice that I think hopefully will be very helpful for you. And that's as follows. You know, when people want to start a business, um, the most important thing to ever have starting a business, people come with all different ideas to start a business, right? Any investor that's worth their salt will ask for one thing, and that is a business plan. And the joke is, you know, in venture capital world, you know, not, not the multi-million dollar deals, but people that invest in, in companies, 50, 100, $200,000, the joke is amongst themselves is that they take the business plan and they throw it into the garbage. They call it the circular file. Why is that? Why do they ask for it? Because the business plan was never for the investor. The business plan was for the business owner. It was for the business owner, the person starting the business to sit down and think through every single nuance, what they need, what the money's for, what the market's gonna be like. People have a dream for the 30,000 feet up. The business plan makes them come down on, ground, on, on the ground floor and saying, who's your market? What's day one? What are your expenses? The business plan is for the person running the business, not so much for the investor. Once they know you have a business plan, they're more comfortable. So an answer to your question is, while you, we have a ton of experience, and companies are always looking at people with experience. It's a great thing with experience. It's important to really sit down and almost interview yourself and say, what do I specifically want to do? And if and I'm, I can't stress this enough. People say, you know, Adam, come on. I know what I want to do. I want to have an office job. I want to have a, a job, you know, a manager. I want to work here. But it, when you drill down to it, interview yourself. Where do you want to work? What type of company do you want to work with? I'll tell you something fascinating. Have you ever, ever had the experience where someone gets a new car, you, you get a new car, you lease a new car, and the next day you see your car on the road all over the place? There's a part how the brain works that whatever is on someone's radar screen, this is a very you know, fascinating topic, you end up seeing it all around you. So what I'm getting at is that when someone's very clear and specific on the job and career they want, really clear, really clear, amazing how they're going to see more opportunities to present themselves with people they meet that are actually relevant to help them get that type of job. So my advice to you is as follows. Although instead of mailing out all the resumes, 
Be laser focused in interviewing yourself on what you want, where you want, how you want to work, when you get paid, how many hours, what industry, what skill set, exactly the job you want to be in. And then you can speak to people, not in generalities, specifically what you're looking for. And I've seen this time and time again. You'll meet more people that can help you than you did before. Okay, amazing. Adam, we're rocking. Okay, you're on. Hi, as a small business owner and the main um, sales originator of the company, I'd like to know, is there a ratio of how much time you're supposed to spend on your business, building the business versus the activity of the business execution itself? Yes, 100%. I mean, it, it's, it's really going to be three parts to it, right? It's, it's the running of the business. It's, it's dealing with that. But also, if you're not growing your business, your business is going backwards because there's always going to be competition. There's always going to be natural attrition within your current client base. Things naturally just evolve and change. And if you don't do anything, you're not growing, you're actually going backwards. So, you know, the, the overall hedge bone is you want to be focused on making sure you're always growing your business, always growing your business. And you want to always make sure that you're actually not losing business and you're running your business. So pr generally speaking, it's going to be, you know, 60, 20, 20, I meaning you're going to spend 60% of your time running the business, right? actually out there doing it, 20% in operations, and 20% of your time must be set aside for actually growing your business and bringing in new business. And that how, that's how a business will grow with the other 20%. But, you know, there's, there's a great saying, it's I'm not saying, it's, it's a truism, that a task will contract or expand depending on how much time you have for it. You know, I like to liken it to Shabbos coming in July at eight o'clock or December at four o'clock, either way, you're going to rush to the last second, right? We, have, we always know we, we're, we're, we're wired as human beings to take as long or as short as whatever time we have for it. That's why I said earlier, someone's paycheck will contract or expand, depending their expenses will contract or expand depending upon how large their paycheck is. So when someone's running a business, unless you actually carve out that 20% to grow your business, it never happens because the other 60% will grow to 100%. So it's very important to be very diligent and focused and making sure those three buckets are, are met and this way it allows you with, with a, a very clear path to continue to grow your business. Adam Sharp, like it. Okay, you're on. Let's go. Now, Polly. Okay, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Asher. Thank you, Coach Benachem. So I was going to ask this both from a spousal perspective, but I think it applies to partners too. You could have a business with two partners, three partners, and they have different views on money, right? Some want to earn a lot of income and spend a lot, and others want to reduce expenses, right? So spouses too could have different views on money, right? Or prospective spouses in the shidduch market. Some want to spend a lot, and, re and have a lot of expenses and, and, and have a lot of income. Others say, hey, I could earn a little bit less and spend less. So how do you deal with those potential rifts between partners in the workplace, partners in the domestic setting? <laughs> also, Mama, I just want to put one more twist. That's the one thing. Also, what about risk taking as far as partners? A lot of times one partner wants to be much more aggressive with doing more and spending more and taking more risk. Another one is much more conservative. Great. So let's do a partners first. I, I can we can spend one entire program on partnerships in business. So let me and just give you five programs a, on spouses. What's that? Five so let me spouses. just give right. So let me just give you. It's important. You raise a very important point because unfortunately, I come in afterwards when people are in a disagreement in a partnership, and someone wants to grow and expand. Somebody wants to you know scale down. Somebody wants to you know be taken over. Someone else wants to go ahead and continue to pass it on to their children. Other people want to go and invest in new industries and products. People are happy with what they're currently doing. So there's many issues that come up. Um, to put it very succinctly and directly is as follows, is that when a partnership starts, many partnerships don't work. I, I'm going to answer your question a little differently, but it's this point is those people that are looking to start a company, always looking for money many times, right? So when you're starting, a, a starting any partnership, there's two or three points that please keep in mind. Number one is that each partner must bring something to the equation that but for them, you wouldn't be successful. Meaning the great example is somebody that invents a great product he invents a you know a new gadget and he's a great marketer i'm sorry, excuse me, a great inventor and he built it he has no ability to market it or to sell it so there a great shinnock is okay i invented the product let me team with somebody that actually is going to know how to market and sell it and someone that has money and that's a great combination but when people come to the, to the table and they both have money right and they both have the same skill set it's a recipe for disaster because each one thinks to do more than the other person. You never, you know, you think, but for you, the company will not exist. And these things go on and on. So number one, make sure the skill sets complement each other. They're not the same skill set. And the second thing to keep in mind as a partnership, which is incredibly important, it's not a matter of trust, a lack of trust. 
It's not a matter of conviction in your own skill set, but two people can have two completely different visions of what big is. If I said to you right now, what's a big company? Ask five people, you get five different answers. Some people say 100,000, some people say 20. Everyone's different answer. What, what does big mean? So everyone is very well meaning. Partnerships can be the best of friends. However, they may have two different playbooks of what they believe the business should go into and grow into, or two different definitions of certain terms. So without having an agreement upfront of saying, here is my responsibilities in this bucket, here's your responsibilities. Here's when we convert, we, 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 we connect and we speak to each other when they overlap on larger decisions, larger financial situations, things right now we want other person's input. But one person does their job, second person does their job, they have overlapping, you know, when, 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 when it reaches a certain bar and a certain level of finances or decision making, and that's a healthy partnership. So that's kind of a reverse way to answer your question is before you have a problem, you want to solve it. And that's how you solve the problem. When it comes to shallow and bias, and again, unfortunately, this happens a lot because you have a man and ladies, you know, if they understand this about men, it's very helpful. That a man is driven to succeed and to, and, to, and, and, and to conquer and to go into the proverbial fields and to go in and bring home, you know, pronounce for the family. That's how they're driven. And it's very important that when a man is not fulfilled, he just doesn't feel like himself. He's not himself. And therefore, um, again, I'm obviously from a, from, um, from a male perspective. So I'm, I'm sure there's much to say from a lady's perspective, but from a male's perspective, there's nothing more debilitating when a wife knocks a husband down than ever dream it could be. Because that's how a man defines himself, how he sees himself, how he sees himself in his peers, how he sees himself amongst you know, his business workers, how in friends, uh, amongst his friends, that it is the ability to go ahead and use the talent God gave you to succeed. And if you get knocked down and you get put in the corner, so to speak, and, you, and, you, and your dreams get belittled, it can be very, very tough. So I, 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 I say as follows, it is irresponsible to quit your job and to pursue any hobby you have. You have a responsibility to take care of your family, I'm speaking to the men. However, wives need to understand that a man needs an outlet to pursue whatever God-given talent they have. And that should be done with a smile and the simcha in spare time as they can go ahead and become more successful and that they can hopefully bring money in with that as well. Adam, you opened up the Pandora's box. Here we go. You ready? My husband and I both work. I am the breadwinner by far. I have a two-part problem. A, he feels like less of a husband since he's making a simple salary and I'm making the large money. B, I'm also feeling like he can make, a, make more, he could, be, he could do more by drive, driven to work harder to take more risks. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, it's, it's not, you go back to Moon of a Tuckin again, right? Because that's what, what it is. I mean, you, you can put all the effort in and everything you do, you're responsible for your effort and your stylist, and that's what you're, what you're responsible for. Um, so a lady's, you know, successful doing her thing. A man, it's not really a pronostic question. It's really a self-esteem question, right? A man sees his wife making more money. You know, I deal with this many times. I've, people, people looking for jobs and people that own certain businesses, someone that owns, you know, say a restaurant business and he's looking for a working partner. It took me six months to find a successful restaurant, a working partner to be in the business with him because no the many ladies not want their wives or the husbands being working in a restaurant, not because of the hours, not because of the environment, not because of, because they didn't want to tell their friends that the husband was that. And it was a great job. It was a six figure plus job um, with no risk. And, and you'd be a partner in the restaurant. The point I'm making is that a lady needs to understand that a man needs to succeed and work hard. And a man needs the self-esteem to understand the lady can also be successful and make money and it's, it says nothing about themselves. However, your question was a little different. The wife feels the husband's not really working hard enough and he's not taking the risk and not being you know, diligent enough to, to doing it. And that is an issue because a lot of times a husband will look at a, a wife and say, well, no matter how hard I work, I can't catch up to you, right? No matter what I do, I can't reach your salary. And that, again, is a self-esteem issue, not a pronouncer question. You have to work on yourself and your videos understand right now that the Almighty determined that she should make X amount of money. It's a test for you to still be the simple in your job. And the two things are totally unrelated. That's amazing. Okay, let's go. We have another live question. You're on. Let's go. 
Hey, hi, excuse my voice, I have a little cold. Um, what percentage of hirings um, might be, in a general way, might be based on age or appearance, do you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a toughie. You're asking a very, very intelligent question. And you know, we, there, there's the, the PC answer, and then there's the real life answer. Right. So I'm going to give you the PC answer. And the PC answer really is, is that ultimately, you know, people should get a job based upon their merit and not uh, not anything else. Right. But um, for better, or for worse, you know, there are other elements that come into 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 the Hezbollah and people hiring it. And, and, and I'll, 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 I'm going to say a very important point. And I deal with this on the men's side all the time. That's as follows. You know, there's a great, um, there's a great um, uh, a saying that doesn't give it just, but Rabbi Leib Kellerman says a great concept that midos don't split. Midos don't split. Meaning that if a guy or a lady, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, um, is not airlock and, and they, and they, and they, and they, and they, and they, and they cut corners, you know, in their personal life, the mida of cutting corners will carry into the business life. And that's where midos don't split. When I meet people looking for a job, it's not necessarily, you know, the easiest thing to do. I don't understand it, but sometimes people come and they're just not put together. I mean, a shirt has their breakfast, lunch, and dinner on it. You know, it's not tucked in. It just makes no sense because what you're saying is a message that you don't necessarily, you know, care so much about your appearance and therefore maybe you don't care about your job or you don't care about the workplace, you don't care about your coworkers, you don't care about the job you do here. If something comes, you know, come into you into, into an environment and it's all sloppy and messy and a big disarray, that means that maybe when you come to work, it's going to be sloppy and disarray. We can't afford that in our company. So while appearance, you know, or, or, or age, whatever you said, I'm sure plays a factor into it, what plays a much bigger factor into it is how someone's presents themselves and that is within everyone's control because it doesn't split if someone comes in and they're presentable it means they'll t treat their job in a presentable way and the converse is true they've done many many studies about you know you know it was a big thing in the 80s and 90s was you know casual friday i'm sure it still exists in some now everything's casual it seems like but it was everything was suit and tie in the 80s and 90s and the casual friday and there is so many studies how pr productivity went down so much because people no longer saw themselves as an executive. And people work home, you know, Corona certainly put this thing on steroids, but when people did work home, you know, 15, 20 years ago, when they were home one, two, three or four times a month, studies were showing that if they just wore the same business attire for a man with suit and tie at home, they got more done and better results because they understood how you Present yourself to yourself is how people perceive you, even if they never saw you. So the answer to your question is, you know, ultimately, maybe other things play a factor into it, but much is in your control in terms of how you present yourself and how you take care of yourself. Very good. Here's, is it possible to feel calm and content about what Hashem has given me when I just don't feel I have enough? I have needs and wants that I can't afford, I can't afford, and I know everything is from Hashem. I just try to accept it, but deep down, I'm frustrated and annoyed. So it's not necessarily a business question or a question. It is a Batakan question, and I can't encourage enough to listen to the Batakan hotline. I will share the number, believe that with you. But it will, he covers this point, Rabbi Golembek does, in detail, talking about that if you got something right now um, at this stage of your life, it's, it will be poison for you because you don't have the wherewithal to be able to go ahead and navigate you know, they say people win the lottery, you know, all of a sudden their lives are upside down. You know, they went, there's, there's windfall. And my brother David has a great concept and great line, which says, you know, people just, and when they win the lottery, they now have a lot of ammunition to make a lot of poor decisions. You know, you just have all this money coming in. Other people say they had the money coming in and they make great decisions. So if you don't have the success right now, again, a thought may be that if you had a bounty full of money right now, it may just be, a lot of ammunition to do a lot of decisions that may not be the best thing for you. Having said that, if you want a lot of money, then you need to analyze kind of, you know, where you're holding and why it's good for you. And the more you get clarity on why the money is good for you and what you're going to do with it, I've seen it time and time again, things do turn around. Beautiful. Okay. Let's jump into the next question. We have a few more live pending, but I want to, I want to cover some of these. Okay. So these are tough questions, Adam. Good luck. 
I have a good job and I make over $150,000 a year, which does not cover my basic expenses. I would love to go on my own and open a company, but my wife claims it's irresponsible. After all, I make more money than my friends. At the same time, I'm not covering all my expenses. There's no extra money for a rainy day. What does a person do in that situation? Great. And, th and this actually happens much more often than people think. People, again, I do a lot of uh, you know, top salespeople and many top salespeople as they're working in any industry, there's, you know, industry where they, well, many industries in sales. And um, a lot of times they want to go on their own or someone is, you know, running a store and they're there. But for them, you know, people say this a lot, but in many cases it is true for them. But for them, there is no store. There is no business. They I are. Somebody, somebody texts them. I just want to address it. Somebody says, poor thing can't survive on $150,000 a year. So and th 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 this is why I never, ever touch that. You know, it's, it's I, I don't, you know, that's people like, can that's say, I'm sorry, Adam, I'm sorry. I just wanted to change the question. Make a very nice money, but a lot of people have a job, and a lot of jobs have a cap. It could be a hundred, it could be a hundred. Forget about the hundred and fifty. Just that you reach a cap. Every every position, whether it's an office manager, has a cap. Nobody's gonna pay an office manager more. So you reach your cap, but you're not making your expenses. Sorry. Great. No, it's, it's a great point, I, and I, I I do touch on that point many times. People, you know, it, you know, you can be the great. I tell people that are looking for a raise, you can be the greatest X in the world. There's a certain amount that 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 will pay you. But there are people right now that know that if you want to get uncapped income, you start your own business, you know, you work for yourself there, you know, you, you know, or you go in certain industries that allow you to do that. But here's the most important thing to understand. And please hear this is that when people, you know, are in different industries and they want to go and they start on their own and, you know, they're, they're working and they're doing great and they're getting great success and they want to start on their own. Um, a, a few things to keep in mind. Number one is, you know, it's not all that's cracked up to be. People look at people that start their own business. They only look at the at the pluses and they look at, they don't understand how much comes with that. Assuming you get past that part and you say, I do want to start my own thing and go into the, the most important thing to remember is that you don't want to be irresponsible and quit a job that's bringing in real money, that's consistent. You have a steady flow of clients and people that run a company, whether they're a top salesperson, they're a top manager, they're running a store, they're, 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 they're in charge of any business, and they really run the shop, I'll give you three quick pieces of advice. Number one is, before you leave, many, many times, the owner will recognize your talent, and they recognize the value you bring, and you may be much better off asking for a different structure that allows you to earn more money without leaving, specifically profit sharing, potentially a raise, bringing new clients, starting a new division, opening up a new location. Many times you can be, you can be this entrepreneurial spirit inside your Dalit Amis, and it's a lot less risk and you get just as much upside. That's point number one. Point number two is that you have to be careful when you do start something new, think of starting something new, that it's important to know that the dial switch I mentioned earlier still plays a role. Meaning that if you wanna start something yourself, don't quit your current job. It's irresponsible. However, in night times and weekends, you can go ahead and take something else on that allows you to do two things. It allows you to use more of the talent God gave you because of things that you enjoy. And number two, allows you to bring more money in. And the third thing was probably the most important thing is that if you're looking to make more money and looking to kind of stake out on your own, many times there are other people that feel the same way you do. And if you do want to stake out on your own, this may be a great time to leverage a relationship with somebody else. And although partnerships sometimes don't work out, I've seen many times people leave in this situation. Two people are kind of, you know, capped out where they are and they start something new. And the reason why it's very effective is there's a concept that one plus one equals infinity. The value of two people create a sum of the third thing, which is greater than individual parts together. So many times people that are capped out in a certain industry and they team with somebody else, they do create something very special. And that's something else potentially to keep in mind. Amazing. And this is a big question and I'm gonna generalize it. And I know this is, this is really the crux of it. Okay, you ready? I'm, just, I'm giving you the wind up. Please. Can you throw the ball? I started working in a commission-based business. I don't seem like I'm able to make it in this industry. It could be industry. One guy does this, another guy does this. My friend, who I don't think is as good as me, and is super successful, successful in making a tremendous amount of money. Why for him? Yes, even though I'm much better than him, and why for me not? This, even if not in sales or you're not in commission, I encourage everyone to hear this. This applies to everybody. Because you have many companies will hire, you know, let's pick a, you know, company ABC Incorporated that hire 10 people, 10 salespeople, 
all the same day. Hear this very carefully, please. They had the same office, the same manager, the same leads, the same commission structure, the same manager, the same product, the same service, the same sales training, same everything. Yet six months later, the 10 people, three people quit, two people are eking by a paycheck, two people make a little more, one person is a rock star, they're making a million dollars a year. Why is such a disparity between everyone with the same background? They all had no previous sales experience. They all had no previous work experience. They all in the same environment with everything, all the exact same, what separates them? And there are a handful of points, but go back to what this is, is that everybody has a different skill set, the things that come naturally. Some people right now enjoy meeting people face to face. Some people enjoy being on the phone. Some people believe in selling a service, a product. They want to have a, what's called a longer sales cycle, meaning they sell a product. And if everything goes smoothly, it may take three, six months for them to actually get paid a commission check. Other people sell a product or service to get paid the next day. There are different personalities that resonate with different products. So there's three points. Number one is the most important thing answer to your question is as follows. You must have undeterred belief in the product or service you're selling. You can't do it for the commission, can't do it for the paycheck, can't do it for the prestige. You must say the following in the affirmative. If I wasn't working for this company, would I buy this product or service? Would I recommend this product or service to my closest friend? Would I do this? My family calls me up that it would trust me if I say buy this product and this service at this price. The answer is no. With respect, I would find a different career because you're only going to eat by a paycheck. You'll never make a living. True success comes from utter belief in your product. That's number one. Once you have belief in the product, people, you know, get calls or they get sales pitches or they hear about product and services from advertisements all day long. There must be something unique about what you have. And the second point is almost as important as the first point. And that is to remember that when you're selling a product or service, you have the belief, everyone will reject you. Open up a new business, they reject you. In sales, they reject you because people are programmed as consumers to say no to everything. Your spouse, your friends, your neighbor. Unfortunately, there can be much negativity to rejecting it. So understand when you, not that you don't be, be positive, but accept the fact when people say no, they're not saying no to you or the, they're just saying no because that's to the wire. So don't be deterred, don't be frustrated, don't be, don't let it set you back. And without question, don't quit. Number one, have belief. Number two, keep marching on when you say no. And the third point is many times people are literally one more day, one more week, one more phone call to success. So people I find time and time again, they're right there and they just quit too soon. So stick in the game, keep your head in the game, follow through and you'll find success can be there if you have those other two ingredients. Okay, very good. The question came in, somebody working in his company already now for five years, he did get a raise already. Question is when he can go and ask a raise again. I don't know, so, somebody else texted, I just want to say, people, a lot of people talking about raises, when to ask, how to ask. Let's get a little bit into the raise question. Sure, sure. So many people are afraid to ask for a raise. Why? Because they're afraid of rejection. They're afraid they might hear, you know, the word no. They don't want to be chutzpah, they're coming to the, to the boss. So quick tips on how to get a raise, right? You know, you don't ask for the first way. The best way to do it, by the way, it, and this doesn't apply to many people, when you are getting a job and negoti negotiating a salary and you get, let's just say, you know, someone's okay, your, first, your salary is $75,000 for the year. At that point, it's a great time to say, with your permission, I'd like to come back to you after three months or six months or eight months and be able to talk about how well I'm doing and how much value I'm adding to the company and see if potentially you would consider maybe adjusting that and giving me a small bonus based on how well I'm doing. I want your permission to come to you in six months. It's a very non-threatening way to say you want to ask for a raise. Let's assume you didn't do that and you meet with them after six months, eight months or a year and you sit down with them. And the best way to ask for a raise is not to say, I want a raise. Or not to say my coworkers are making more money than I am, they have less experience. Or not to say my friend got a job down the block, the same job they make more than I am. The best way to ask for a raise with a big smile and you say, I enjoy working here. I enjoy the work I'm doing. I think we're doing a great job. I'm sure you're aware of this, but in case you're not and don't know the details, here are three or four specific things I've done to add value in the last six months, three months, two months that I'm very proud of. And there was a direct result on customer service, on people being happier, on larger orders, on better retention. There was not just the work I did, but here's the direct result, how it helped the company. Having said all that, I do add a lot of value to the company. 
and I'd like to ask you for a raise commensurate with the work that I've been doing. That is a great way to ask. Now, most likely, they're going to ask you what were you thinking about or how much raise do you want? And this way, you need to be prepared and literally prepare yourself before you go in to ask for a raise, which is to pick a number that you're very happy about and say directly. And once you say the number, this is the hardest thing you'll ever have to do probably in your life is to close your mouth and not justify or explain it. So when you say, Mr. You know, Mr. Schwartz, the last six months I've been here, I've worked very diligently. I'm not missing days. I'm working very hard, as I'm sure you know. You don't want to make it seem like he's not aware of it. You say, as you know, I'm here on time, or as you know that I helped close the account. As you know, right now, coworkers come to me for training. I enjoy working here and a lot of value. And at this point, I really like to ask for a raise making whatever is appropriate every industry and every time cycle is different but let's say i want to ask you for a fifteen thousand dollar raise that is a complete sentence the next 15 seconds of silence will seem like 15 minutes do your best to remember not to speak and you'll be very surprised the results you get wow adam powerful beautiful okay i'm gonna read this question because um i got in a few different versions but i think it's a great question you ready very relevant where i work the employees are not paid very well but they shower the workers with perks throughout the year. Impressive gifts, everyday breakfast, lunch, lots of extras. They go above and beyond. Now, especially employees are offering so much more than where I am today. It is irresponsible to stay where I am. I love to go to work and I'm, treat and I'm treated all day. I'm also nervous I won't be able to make enough for the growing family in a couple of years. And the market may not be as good as it is now. Great question. I'm sorry, the question was that spending the money on Perks and not on they're, salaries. They're in a place where they're, they feel they're getting underpaid and they're, they're not into salaries. But the, what the company is doing is they're giving them everything that makes the work environment so geschmack and it's so beautiful that should they give up the cushy, cushy comfortability to make more someplace else? Or, you know, listen, maybe I can, you know, work and be more comfortable where I am. Right. Great so question. I, I'm going to say something that I'm, I'm, and whoever asked the question, I'm asking them to really, you know, not push back on the answer, although your knee jerk is going to want to push back what I'm saying. It's not a steerer that you can get a raise and still get a cushy job, meaning the companies out there, we are in an employee you know, driven market right now. There's a big demand for people that are looking for talent. There is nothing wrong with going. Don't assume right now that it's one or the other. Don't assume right now that because you're getting all these perks and because your friend may have gone for a raise and didn't get it, or because the owner may announce, by the way, in lieu of giving big bonuses, we're giving people lunch every day. That's irrelevant. If you feel right now that you are doing a great job and you have, remember when somebody comes into a company and they're there, if you own a company, let's say I, I, I'm, 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 I'm consulting with someone that runs a company. One thing I tell them why it's so important for employee retention is because I, I use this phrase, you paid for their brain, you paid for their mistakes, you paid for the training. They've been here for a year, the first two, three, four months, you paid a lot, you overpaid because they were training, they were learning, you paid for their brain and knowledge right now. So it's so much more important for you to keep somebody happy than to replace them. So whatever you have to do to make people happy, make them happy because to replace them, you're starting again from the bottom. So therefore, the most important thing to do is, as an employee is don't think right now because they're showering you with gifts, you know, it, it, it contradicts the fact that you shouldn't be asking for a raise. I think the opposite. I think right now the company is giving and they're gracious and they recognize that they want to keep people happy. And, and you go, now if you go for the raise and say, by the way, we can't give you a raise, you know, because we're giving you lunch every day, then in the, in the most un way you can say, I appreciate the lunch, I appreciate the perks, I really do. And here's a great thing to say when you're looking for a raise, I'm asking out of necessity, not out of desire. I'm asking out of necessity, not our desire. I need to get a raise. And it's a great way to be very direct. And you'd be surprised once again what you may get. As long as you don't speak after you ask for the raise, because then it sounds like you're unsure of yourself at that point. Okay, let's go on a little bit different topics. I'm going to go a little bit now. A few questions of people that are making money, a little bit different angle. Here we go. Um, I'm 40 years old. I was making a tremendous amount of money. I was very successful. I thought I was on top of my game and I had everything I wanted. I went through a very hard time and lost all my money and my business closed down. I'm a simple salary, salary, salary employee and basically okay with Hashem's decision. I'm having a very hard time seeing my other friends now in the same position and living this very hotsy totsy life when I've been through the first full circle. Can you please give me some advice? 
and how to do advice it. I give you is you have something, and everyone should hear this. You have something right now that you can't buy, you can't teach, and you can't read in a book. And that is this. There are so many stories littered in the business world, littered in the business world, of people who went from rags to riches, back to rags, and back to riches again. Why do people have nothing, make a fortune, lose everything, and come back bigger and stronger than ever before? Why is it disproportionate to people that actually make it the second time, so disproportionate that people actually never made it initially? The answer is very simple. There's nothing more powerful than the belief you could do something. Once you saw you can do it and you succeeded and you actually were successful yourself, you know right now you can do it. So there's nothing more powerful than people that made it, lost it, and is seeing that proverbial you know, bottom again, and you know you've been there before. So the best thing you do for yourself is, it sounds corny, but really, you know, dust off your, 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 your clothes, get back up and get back in the ring, you know, because I'll talk about this, you know, the, the true Sadiq and the true champions, you know, not that they get knocked down seven times, but they get up seven times. You will get knocked down and you can get back up again. And I think it's very important to know that people that failed, so to speak, and it's, it's a dramatic word, but if you lost your money financially, it's no indication of anything. Think about you know, the financial crisis, people that were on top of the world, so to speak, financially, they were very smart people. The many, many of them, I know them personally, many of them are back stronger than they ever were back you know, during the crisis. Why? Because they know they can do it. And that's just a key thing in success. Adam, my friend who has a lot of employees under him, he says, I'm not Michael you tonight. There's going to be 62 people in my office tomorrow asking for a $20,000 raise. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's get into this question now that we're in this thing over here. My spouse used to be a nice guy. Recently, he started making a lot of money and he's arrogant and mean. Can you please explain to me what is going on with him? It's very sad, and you know it, 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 it's it's sad, but you know there, it's um, unfortunately money, as you know, uh, Coach Menachem said when he first started, you know, will bring out it puts a spotlight on people's meadows, and it does do that for people. But there's two things to keep in mind as a spouse, and this is important to know that many times people are doing well financially, but they are still very insecure. You know, being successful financially is not a contradiction to being incredibly insecure. You can be a very insecure and low self-esteem billionaire. You can be, you know, incredibly high self-esteem and incredibly high self-worth and have very little money. So it's not a contradiction to say that people have low self-esteem and are very wealthy financially. That's point number one. So if the spouse, you know, is surprised by the husband's behavior, you know, it may just be the person right now is, is really desiring the fact that they put on this facade and this big show that they're out there, you know, you know, arrogant and about Gaiba because, you know, in, it, it compensates for very low and shallow, you know, of a, a, a person which is an important thing as a spouse to understand that you don't, you know, you want to make sure that you can help this person and fill them up where they need it from their self-esteem and don't think the success compensated for that. And the second point is as follows, you know, people that get success financially, um, there is many studies on this and it shows people how they went ahead and they, you know, start doing things that were outside the bounds because they felt entitled. They felt that they're smarter. They felt that because I'm now successful, it must mean that I'm better than somebody else. It must mean that I know more. It must be that I'm quicker, better, faster, smarter. And therefore it now, you know, runs off into other parts of the life. They can treat the waiter or waitress a little more arrogantly. They can treat the landscaper a little more directly, treat the housekeeper a little more, you know, obnoxiously because they feel like right now they're successful financially. It must be that on a subconscious level or sale in a conscious level, I'm now better than somebody else because I'm money in business i must be smart i must be talented and therefore i'm better and therefore i can treat people differently because they are less than me um, so it's as a spouse that was how your question was recognize this all comes down from sadly from a the first part was self-esteem and the second person the person just feels like they have a a, a warped perception of people that are around them so it's not that the money made this person this way Unfortunately, it's how the person was. The money just brought it out in them. And the best way to be as a spouse, be empathetic, be loving, be caring, and make sure you can feed them in a way they need to be fed versus focusing on the external Balgaba part of it. Does it actually help when somebody makes more money? Does it help for their self-esteem? 
again, many times it's the opposite because they're living with a massive contradiction, right? They have all, they get all these Yasha Kowaks and people say how smart they are and they get honored here and, and, and Yasha Kowaks Adam, there. Adam, 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 it is a fact that when you make money, you become better looking and smarter. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. So yeah, everyone tells you so much. I know it's a, uh, yeah. And they also, and they also expect you to pick up the check also. You know, um, you know the famous joke, right, Adam? Come on, you know this joke. So the guy used to be a very rich guy. He used to give tons of stuff up and he lost all his money. And then he said, I don't understand. People, I understand you don't come to them anymore for tzedakah. I don't have money to give, so I can't give you. But they ever used to come to talk to me and show Eitzah and advice. I'm still, what happened to that? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That, that, that's, and that, that's what happened. So the thing is, you know, it, 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 it doesn't, again, a person has strong self-esteem. This is, people have strong self-esteem and, and a high self-worth. It is, it is undeterred and unwavering and doesn't, doesn't change with the wind or financial success. I mean, people that are high self-esteem, they can make a lot of money, lose a lot of money. It doesn't change who they are as a person. Conversely, people that right now have low self-esteem, the money will change their personality because they have to compensate for the low self-esteem. So, uh, you know, self-esteem is complete unrelated to financial success, in my opinion. Beautiful. Okay, let's go. You're on live. Adam, uh, thanks for taking my question. Great to, great to see you. Thank you. Um, someone that has a little extra money, should they put it in the stock market or should they uh, pay off their current mortgage? And, um, and, you know, there's different views on that. And uh, another question would be, is it better to go in the stock market or should you go into your friend's really good real estate deal yeah. with a guaranteed 12% yield? Sure. Yeah. Made up, made I covered this a little earlier today, and again, program. I'm not a financial, uh, you know, I don't, give, don't want to give financial advice, I'm not a financial advisor, and it's irresponsible to say where to put your money, but I will say as follows, is that the more someone, I said this earlier, more someone invests in things that are quote-unquote outside their control, the more anxious they become, so if you, if it's money that you don't care about losing, so to speak, and that if you lost tomorrow will not affect your lifestyle, then, you know, because I'll say where to put, you know, a certain amount of your assets, a certain amount of your money in certain ventures, um, having said that, I I think there is not a better investment to make than in yourself because that you feel like you're at least using the talent the Almighty gave you and you can invest in yourself. There's many ways to make that materialize and actualize. And that's something that gives people not only the ability to actually invest in themselves, but actually gives them a lot of maneuver in the process of using their talent that, that God gave them. If you didn't care where you put it, you just put it in Bitcoin, right? All right. That's <laughs> exactly. And let's get into this yeah. question. First of all, my boss just came on. So I want to say, He's the best boss in the whole world, and I'm so appreciative of him. Tovio, you rock. I love you, bro. Practice asking for a raise. Yes. Tovio, can I please have a massive raise? Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. Okay. I'm Baruch I'm Hashem. could say I'm very successful and make a lot of money. I'm reaching my 50s now, and I'm realizing I cannot depart with a penny. I barely give, an, I barely give to duck or help people on the level that I really could. And even when I spend a few extra dollars, it gives me extreme anxiety. Give me some advice, please. Again, this is more of a rabbinic uh, advice, but I I can, I, you know, p p people that that don't give the money away. Um, forgive me for being so direct, but miss the fundamental point of where the money came from. They think it's really their money. And I'm not partnering with my money. But the reason why you know it's, it's such an oxymoron, it makes absolutely no sense. Because intellectually, you know that the Almighty gave you the money, he gave you a tzlacha, he gave you the right opportunity, he gave everything to go, quote unquote, your way, and you have success. And that's why the Torah says, give 10% of your money away. It's the only time ever the Torah says, the Almighty says, that you can test him. Never, nowhere else in the Torah says, test me, give stucker, and you can get back more than you gave. But why do people struggle with it? Why do people feel like they're parting with the money is so hard to part with? Because they have this fear, this fear right now that they're not gonna get the money back, they may need the money in the future for themselves, they may need the money for an expense, and they completely miss the entire point of where the money came from. There's a great acronym for fear. Fear is false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. That's what fear is. You think right now something is real when it's not real. The fact is right now, money is an illusion. I mean, think about it. Money is there today and going tomorrow. Stocks go up, stocks go down. Real estate's up, real estate's down. It's all just a facade to make us feel, quote unquote, comfortable. Like we're sitting in a chair, we can, you know, and we feel like we can breathe air and we're walking around and there's some order to life. Money gives us that sense that we have security. 
The only security is the Almighty. He's the one that takes care of us. That's why in Sukkot, our roof, whether you're a billionaire or whether you're a pauper, with the same roof above us in the Sukkot, makes absolutely no difference. That is the ultimate and only protection. So when people part the money, they are just um, um, refusing to really internalize a truism inside, the, just like this gravity and works, whether you believe it or not, there's a truism. It is God's money. The Almighty gave you the money. It is your money to be his trustee for. And that's why he is, God has the right to say, you can't charge interest. It's my money. Don't charge interest. It's my money. Give sadaka. It's my money. Be responsible. And you're nothing but a guardian. So if you don't give the money away, what you're saying is, I earned it by myself. I worked hard. I my blood, sweat, and tears. Every nickel I earned with, the, with, 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 you know, with, 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 with so much, you know, so, so much effort and so much toil and so much pain, and I went through it, and I now accumulated all this money, and therefore it's hard to part with it. You missed the last point. Did all those things, but just like you went to the field and you planted corn and you worked and you toiled and you did everything you can for the corn, if your mind doesn't allow rain to fall down, all your effort was for nothing. God made you get that money. Understand that. And therefore, God's telling you to give some of it away as well. Adam, Rabbi Adam now. Okay, let's go. Last live question. I have two more I really got to cover tonight, and then we'll go to closing. Let's go. Last live for tonight. Hi. 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 Thank you for doing this. It's very informative and very, um, very uh, uh, productive. So um, I'm a teacher. I've been teaching for many years. I teach uh, different things. Um, I've taught computers. I've taught Hebrew. I've taught uh, music. I teach privately. I teach in a school. And I'm in college now. But I, um, I'm a single parent. And <clears throat> I just, for some reason, I mean, I mean, not for some reason, salaries in schools are very low. Teaching is not so... Um, how do you say it's not it's not you know very lucrative and and I'm ready for a change I'm 50 years old I'm ready for a change I'm ready for a switch I wanna I wanna cover all my debts I wanna live in abundance I don't wanna you know I love teaching but I see that I'm not I'm not getting where I want I'm not where I want to be and um, I want to know if you can give me any advice I want to switch tracks and um like what? What would you suggest? I would suggest you know, I, last, this was one of my last two questions, by the way. I was going to say is that you know again it's irresponsible just to quit a job and make any sharp sharp turns. But I will say you know that 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 you, the way you describe yourself, it seems like you are very talented and you definitely have things that come to you very easily and naturally. I want to say this point because people, I, I say it, people nod their heads, but they don't internalize the power of it. What comes easy and naturally to people, they don't appreciate what a gift it really is. They think, what's the big deal? Well, everyone can do this, or they don't understand the value they have or the talent they have and how unique it is because it's something that they're born with, they take for granted. I encourage people with any kind of talent, we all have something that we enjoy doing. You take that talent and you find a way how to monetize it in a way that's gonna bring you pleasure and bring you money. Pleasure and money. My mom is a great saying, if you enjoy what you're doing, you never work a day in your life. You want to make sure you're doing something you actually enjoy doing with the talent that you have. And the two things go hand in hand. People that are good at something, they enjoy it. Anything people enjoy doing, they're good at. People don't enjoy things that they're not good at. There's a thing people that are in sales say, I, 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 I hate selling. I hate selling. No, you hate not selling. Selling is great. Selling is wonderful. You hate not selling. People don't like doing things they're not good at. You love doing things you're good at. And what you're good at is a talent God gave you. And therefore, anything you have a talent for, try to find a way how to do anything in your spare time to make that somewhat of a small business to bring more money in. And that could be a gateway to something much, much larger down the road. I definitely, thank you. I definitely enjoy what I do. I love teaching. And I wouldn't want to leave it. It's just that I maybe I need someone to, to guide me. I don't know. No, to, but again, to... I, I wouldn't leave your teaching job, but the things in teaching, again, maybe a curriculum, maybe a course, maybe a book, maybe ways to teach people, maybe tutoring. There's things you can do in addition to what you're doing without changing anything. The things you can do with inside the universe of teaching, right? Inside the teaching, there are 20, 30 things that teachers can do they don't do during the day. 
that they like doing as part of teaching. Of all, maybe it's working with groups, maybe running a weekend program, maybe, maybe running a, a, a Sunday group teaching something. We can, you, know, you can bring some different ideas, but there are many ways to use your teaching passion to bring more money in. And that could actually, have seen it so many times, developing some, something, it may take three, six months, two years, but over time you feel so much better by yourself. You see actually you're moving towards solving a problem. Thank you. Okay, Adam, last question for the night. Somebody texted, please remind Adam the Betochen hotline number, please. You know the number of Ram? Yes, it's a pleasure. Okay. Bear with me, forgive me, but it's it's worth this, it's worth this break for right now. It is that powerful. Okay. And the number is 732 719 3898. 732 719 three eight nine eight and if you listen for just a week and you even hit the questions and answers by hitting number three uh, it will radically change the way you look at your pranasa mom is radically changing okay adam the last question of the night then we're going to go to closing okay here we go i learned in yeshivas and work Baruch Hashem, i'm a very successful person i have it all you could say but at the end of the day i feel inside empty almost like i have everything but i feel unfulfilled excellent and here's the, here's the answer. I'm, I'm, I'm sticking to my story. Here's the answer. The bottom line is you can make all the money in your world that people, unfortunately, in the secular world, they go out to, you know, the West Coast and make all this money, all this fame, all this fortune, and they end up living a destructive lifestyle or even worse. Why? Because ultimately, you only achieve anything in life when you give. And you give to something meaningful and pledge something that, that meaning towards the way you can be in Abed Hashem to go ahead and do something meaningful. So therefore, if you have emptiness, it's one thing. And I can virtually guarantee people that are empty, they're taking versus giving. The more you give, we're wired to be like the Almighty, we're wired to be, wired to be givers. And if you give, hear this point, in a way that allows you to actually earn money in the process, it's paradise. The more you give, and you actually can build a business around giving in some way that comes easily and naturally to you, it's mamish paradise. So you feel empty. It means you're not using the gift the Almighty gave you and to give with that gift. Beautiful, Adam. Wow. Amazing shirt and I really appreciate it. A lot of chizik. I feel like we covered some ground. There's so much more to ask. Um, the question, the Betachan hotline, Menachem will send out an email together with some amazing announcements this week. Menachem, are you going to put it all together? Okay. Here we go. First, I want to give a gosh shkaliach to Rabbi Adam Lieberman for coming on tonight and giving us much chizik and being mechaz of the crowd and really giving some practical takeaway stuff. Really appreciate it. Again, tonight's show will be learned to schos for Menash Chanoch, Ben Reza Shalamas, for success in every endeavor, Baruchnis, Bagashmias, Rafush Lema, for Shandel, Sarabas, Miriam Rivka, the Shir Mitch Shem, there was over a thousand people here total tonight and the thousands that will listen to it. To be a for, for these people to be successful in front of Lema. Again, if anybody wants to join the WhatsApp chats, the WhatsApp chats, please text me. WhatsApp me at 848 525 0066, 848 525 0066, and save my number and I'll send you every Sunday the flyers. Please send it around, post it on the chats. We need to grow it more and more. This is the Batochan hotline right here. We work on it every week on different angles. Uh, again, every Sunday night at 9 30 is the new time. This Zoom ID, we have different topics. It's amazing. Next week, we're going to have Rabbi Fryim Glassman, the world-renowned master of Chinuch from Tarev Das. We'll be discussing navigating through the Chinuch system when it doesn't work for my child, doesn't work for your child. It's very deep, powerful. Please join. Let, let everybody know about it. Um, everything is recorded tonight. It'll be tomorrow on MenachemBarnfeld.com. If anybody has any questions for Menachem Barnfeld or for Adam Lieberman, please email CoachMenachem at gmail.com. We will forward everything to him. Um, and we'll give him the message. Again, tonight's share is share number 79, and it'll be up on our phone lines from tomorrow at 848-777-GROW. That's 848-77-GROW. I want to thank our advertising sponsors, The Lakewood Scoop, Rabbi and Yanif Chazak, and Chayla Kaplan Shmuzan for JCN. And a thank you to uh, OK Clarity. The, the Coach Menachem Show is collaborating with OK Clarity to bring greater health and wellness to the Jewish community around the globe. OK Clarity is the online platform for mental health support. In the Jewish community, okclarity.com, you can find the best therapists, coaches, nutritionists, engage in forums, and stay inspired. Links will be emailed after the show. Coach Menachem, closing words, followed by Adam Lieberman. Thank you very much, Adam. I think the, tonight was a very spiritual sheer. Just to understand where money comes from and wherever you are to understand 
that sometimes, yes, it is better for you where you are. And the clarity, what do you want? What are you going to do with the money? Where, where do you want to go? And then uh, come up with a plan. And the last thing, and the most important, is tefillah. Before you do anything, say a tefillah to Hashem, listen, you know, I'm here for you. And uh, I believe I need this. Please help me figure this out. And with the clarity, Hashem will help that we have what we need in Mitzvah Hashem. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you. One second. I'm having a thing here. One second. Adam, you ready? This is what somebody made for that. Tell me if you can see it. No. Can you see it? No. Oh, yeah. Here we got it. Fear. Is that yours, Adams? Oh, beautiful. Fear, false evidence, appearing real. Adam, leave Very nice. Okay. Now we have the honor of hearing a closing chizik. Adam, leave the, leave the oilam with inspiring words. Let's go. The floor is yours. Cool. Thank you very much again for having me. 12. We have to end by 12. We have to go. Okay. All right. Just uh, a quick two minutes. You know, I, I, you know, in all the experience I do this, many things repeat themselves over and over again. And there's nothing new under the sun. And people are looking for jobs or they're in jobs or they want to move on. They want to get a better career. They're not making enough money. You know, it's the same things that, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, so to speak, you hear time and time again, because I do feel there are some consistent, you know, aces that help people tremendously. I think the biggest and best takeaway um, that people can look back is that every year, you, you know, you start Rosh Hashanah off, you have a, a, a desire, you have goals, you have your plans, and somehow things never get on first base. And I just encourage people two things. Number one, have a real plan. Have you have the experience where you, the entire day goes by and you were busy being busy, you all day long you were busy, but what got done? Unless you start each day with a proactive plan or what you plan to do, there's two ways to have your day, either reactive or proactive. Either you're reactive all day to every text, to every WhatsApp, everything, and you're reactive all day long, or you're proactive. And there's great you know, techniques on time management, how to carve your day out. I bring this up for one important point. It is very difficult to, 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 to take the next level, whether to start your own company or to add more value to your business where you're currently working to ask for a raise or to start a side gig you know, on weekends or, or at nighttime, unless you manage your day and you manage your time. So it's incredibly, incredibly important to make sure that you're the master of your day, not the other way around. And here's the last point. You know, people always regret the things normally, normally, that they didn't do, not the things they did. You know, no one looks back at 120 years and say, ah, I wish I was more anxious. I can't believe I was not more, I can't believe I was not more stressed. I should have been more stressed out when I was younger. No one says that. People look back at 120 years and they look back and they, you know, long for the days when they had more co-op and they could have had more time with their family. They should have stressed less. And more importantly, they should have taken the shot. They should have taken that shot because right now you have the opportunity, as much as things may be lacking, whether it be time, whether it be money, whether it be maybe, you know, family support in terms of emotional support, guess what? There's never a better time than right now if you have the opportunity to do something. No one looks back and say, there's never a perfect time. There's a perfect time to know people that sit. There's no perfect time. There's always something, always a simple, always an event, always life. Things will always happen. Your goal of life is to carve out what's important to you and take the gift from birth, the God-given talent, God-given talent the Almighty gave you. Take that, use it in a way to bring money in, and you'll literally be living in paradise. Mamish. Adam, beautiful shirt, but I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Everybody here, thank you for coming tonight. I think the 9.30 Menachem is the best, best, no? Go to sleep a little beautiful, bit. Beautiful. 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 <laughs> okay, and that's November 14th next week. We're from Glassman. See you all. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.